Welcome to A Century of Service, Stories of Alberta's Military History, sponsored by the South Alberta Light Horse Regimental Association. I am Lieutenant Colonel Retired Robert McKenzie, and with me today is Captain Don Gerling, CIC, and our special guest is Captain Barry Duffield. And uh, welcome, Barry. Uh, Thank you, Rob. Barry is the incoming commanding officer in number 15 uh, Air Cadet Squadron in Medicine Hat. And uh, how long have you been involved with the Air Cadets, Barry? I actually started uh, with the Air Cadets after I left, left the British forces and come to Canada. Um, I started with, with them around 15 years ago, and I started as a civilian instructor after leaving the British forces. Um, this was in Strathmore. And when, when I first started with Strathmore uh, Squadron, I felt as though I had something to give back. Um, a lot of experience, especially with the aviation industry. And so I became a civilian instructor and I, I remained a civilian instructor for around four years. And then someone thought it would be a good idea to get back into uniform. Mm -hmm. So uh, <coughs> you decided to uh, sign up to be the CIC officer. How did you find that um, process? The, the process was quite long because of the previous British experience. Um, I, I think the, the application took a little longer than, than generally it should have done. Um, it took around three years to, to do that. But once I was in uniform um, and because I had previous military experience, I was promoted fairly quickly and um, integrated into what I wanted to do, how I wanted to give back. Which obviously is your love for flying, I suspect. It is, yeah. I've, I've loved um, flying ever since I saw my dad get into helicopter when I was eight years old, and I, and I knew that's something that I wanted to do. Now let's go back uh, at the very beginning. You were born in uh, England. No, I was, born in, I was born in Germany. Okay, you were born in Germany, and uh, obviously you were in a military family. That's correct. My, my father was in the Army Air Corps as well. As an ex, he was an ex-gunner. Um, so artillery before he moved over to the Army Air Corps uh, where he crewed helicopters um, in in the British Army of the Rhine which we know as Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you remember anything about your experiences in Germany? No, I was too young to remember anything in Germany. We, we moved to uh, the UK with my, my father's posting um, when I was around eight, three years old. Oh. So you don't remember Germany at all, but your UK experience. That's uh, correct. Uh, <coughs> so you're, uh, you moved over to England when you were three, and uh, your dad was still in the Army Air Corps. Did he retire from the Army Air Corps? He, he did, yes. We, um, we lived in North Yorkshire for around two to three years, and he retired as a, as a corporal and, um, uh, and left the, the Army Air Corps at that time to uh, pursue his... Um, his interest in truck driving. <laughs> mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, uh, now in England, uh, you attended a cadet, or, uh, a cadet similar to our cadet organization? Yes, I did. Uh, the Air Cadets in the UK is very similar to the organization we have here. And um, I joined at uh, 11 years old, and, and I wasn't supposed to be joining at 11 years old. It's, it's 12 years old. But because uh, they, they saw that I was extremely keen, um, they let me stay without taking me on the books. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was 12 years old, then I could f get fully integrated and get into uniform. And um, I had a cadet career all the way up until I joined the British forces. Okay, uh, you mentioned that you were uh, with the Junior Leaders Regiment, Royal Armoured Corps. That's correct. Uh, what, what was that? Uh, the Junior Leaders Regiment Royal Armoured Corps is a service of one year where young potential soldiers go to train for that year but are not eligible to join the adult service. Mm -hmm. So at 16 and a half I joined the, um, the Junior Leaders Regiment and the regiment is a collection of multiple arms and services. Mm -hmm. So for instance, Royal Armoured Corps says it all, we had mm -hmm. the, the tank corps there. Um, we also had the Army Air Corps training. Um, we had the pay corps there as well for some reason, and the, the military police. Is this full time? It is full time. And are you paid? 
you're paid just as just the same as you would be um, in regular service. In fact, the service number that I had in the Junior Leaders Regiment went on to be the, the regular service number that I had. Now, uh, how did that, uh, you were promoted to sergeant as a junior leader, and uh, when you joined the, uh, when you passed out to join the Army Air Corps? That's correct. So, how did that benefit you when you joined the Army Air Corps, being in the uh, junior leaders uh, regiment? I don't think the promotion purely purely the promotion was the thing that would have helped. Being in the environment of junior leaders was, was, a, was a massive springboard for anybody who, who was joining the, the, the military at all, if they're able to do some, some junior service, mm -hmm. that is a, is a massive springboard, no matter what rank they get to. And the reason I say that is because when we did join, we would join other members when we get to our regiment and those members who hadn't been in the junior leaders regiment um, as, a, as a young soldier, there was a, a definite difference between the training that they had received within their six weeks of training to the year training that we had had. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm correct, but it, when you do that one year training and you actually then join uh, the reg force, uh, the regular uh, army, uh, do they credit that, that, that year towards your, um, your pensionable service? They don't. They don't? No, only pensionable service from 17 and a half is, is used. So it, it really is a practice, <laughs> a practice for full service. And then you were able to, to uh, get into the Army Air Corps straight away? I was, yes. There was an entrance exam for the Army Air Corps, which happened before getting into junior service. And that was an aptitude test that found out whether we were good enough for specific regiments. So for instance, the intelligence corps was the highest on the totem pole to, to get into. And I think infantry was, was one of the lowest ones. So the aptitude testing essentially decides on which, uh, which corps would be bit best be fitting for you. And also it would decide on whether what you want to go into um, is, is fitting for your level of aptitude. Okay, so you joined the Army Air Corps as a ground crewman. That's right. What does a ground crewman do? Well, they are the good guys that refuel the aircraft for the pilots. Um, they move the aircraft on the, the pan from the hangar and then put them, put them back at the end of the evening. Uh, they also are asked to help clean uh, the air crew predominantly clean the aircraft themselves, but the, the ground crew do ask to, uh, to, to help out with that. Mm -hmm. um, there's also other jobs such as driving military vehicles mm -hmm. um, for any particular task that we were asked to do, and, and also using the, uh, the handheld radios and the vehicle operated radios and being trained on that. Do you, do you assist the technicians doing their work too? Absolutely not. No, no. The, the technicians have got a, a very important job mm -hmm. and um, a, a very high paid license yeah. in order to make sure that the aircraft are airworthy. So now you were, once you were in there, you were, <clears throat> how long were you ground crew? I was ground crew for three years and I decided that the promotion within um, ground crew was very slow and I knew that I wanted to fly. I decided to um, get into a, a, different, um, a different service and that was that of administration. I also liked administration. I'm as a, I feel as I'm a very organized person and it fit, fit very well. It was um, a quicker promotion and also it fit what, what I wanted to do. Uh, and this of course took me away from being a ground crewman, um, but it, it put me in the office still working with the Army Air Corps um, and, uh, and working through administration and then later on into finance, which helped me in later life as well. So if, if I, but was that the time that you went into the parachute regiment or is that a subsequent thing? It was, yes. So once the decision was made to become an administrator, the British Army decided at, at some point that all the administrators throughout the whole of the British Army would come under one banner. And that was called the Adjutant General's Corps. 
Um, and uh, it, it wasn't something we knew was going to happen. It, it just happened. And we had the option to either join the Adjutant General's Corps or lose the promotion that we had and go back on the ground. So it was an easy, it was an easy um, decision for me to make and join the Adjutant General's Corps. Unfortunately, of course, now I'm post postable anywhere. And uh, my next posting was with the 7th Parachute uh, Regiment, Royal Horse Artillery, um, in Aldershot in su southern England. Okay, you mentioned that you uh, had one tour in the United States with the uh, 7th Parachute Regiment. So the Airborne Brigade was based on about seven or eight um, regiments. And um, we had one parachute regiment, second parachute regiment, and uh, I was part of the 7th Parachute Royal Horse Artillery Regiment. Mm -hmm. um, we also had the Parachute Field Ambulance. Mm -hmm. um, we, we all went, we all went. And we joined with the, the airborne troops of Fort Bragg. Mm -hmm. And that was the exercise that led to the largest parachute descent since D-Day, D-Day landings. Um, it was called Exercise Purple Star, and it was, a, it was a pleasure to be a part of. So what was your role then? Because obviously uh, you weren't, I don't think you were a jumper, were you? I was not a jumper. I decided not to. It was, it was an opportunity for me to take. Um, I knew that I wanted to be a pilot at some point, and I didn't want anything to interfere with that uh, health-wise. So I decided not to do the parachute course. Uh, P Company is what it's called. Mm -hmm. um, I decided to stay as an administrator at this time. And because I wasn't a jumper, I was given a sports parachute and uh, asked to hold a camera for the, for the, for the guys leaving the Hercules and uh, made, some, made some good footage for that. Now, uh, you decided to get back to your first desire, and that's you applied for a pilot. Yeah, it, I, I spent three years with the, with the Royal Horse Artillery, and I, I, I lost sight of what I was in the Army for, and I joined the Army because I wanted to fly. In fact, I did ask my dad if I could be a, an airline pilot one time, and he said, I don't have any money, you join the Army, and you learn to fly that way. So, so that's the reason I did join the Army. And it wasn't until three years after being with the Royal Horse Artillery that I decided that this isn't necessarily going in the direction I wanted to. I had to be um, a Lance Corporal recommended for a Corporal, and I had to have done four years, which I'd already done at that point. Mm -hmm. So I decided that the next step was, was to apply for the Army Pilots course. And what's involved with applying for the Army Pilots course? I mean, you apply, but what's involved to be getting accepted? For the acceptance for the Pilots course, you f obviously, first of all, put your application in. And, and I think that is, that I, I shouldn't gloss over that too much because a lot of people don't get involved in things because they don't want to ap apply because they don't maybe think they're good enough. And, um, and, and it was one of the things that I did have to get over because putting an application form in built, builds up your expectation or, or hopes. And, and I didn't want them dashed because maybe I wasn't, wasn't good enough or wouldn't meet the cut. So I, I did get over that. I, 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 I did apply. Uh, the first thing that they, they do for you is they, they send you through aptitude testing. And I went to a place called Biggin Hill in England and I went through a series of aptitude tests where they have little cards and they put a little guy on the front and they say, is the guy wearing um, a blue shirt or a yellow shirt? Is he holding a red square or a green triangle? And then they flip it upside down and turn it around to make sure that you can see which hand it's in and, and ask you mm -hmm. questions based on that. And other things like memory tests, looking uh, also at um, a screen on a computer and, and deciding whether the aircraft is banking to the left or to the right or climbing and descending and, and eliminating the seven other possible questions that they have underneath. So that was part of the aptitude testing. Um, once that was finished, there's a, a stringent medical that you have to pass and I, I managed to pass that medical. And then finally, in order to get on the course, they, they, they try, want to find out whether you are teachable to fly. So there is a grading course that you're sent on of 13 hours with an instructor. And that grading course, you could start on day one and leave on day two and not make the cut, or do all 13 hours and still not be deemed mm -hmm. um, suitable for flying training. Uh, 
Uh, fortunately, I did pass all of those, and after the interview that I had, um, I, was, uh, I was accepted into the Army Pilots course. Um, on, on the interview panel was um, an ex-sergeant who was now a full colonel who uh, flew with my father. So I'd like to think that there was uh, a little bit of, little bit of help from, f from, from, from <laughs> daddy there. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's the case. Yeah. <clears throat> so now with your flight training school, um, I, I presume you don't start out flying helicopters. Do you do a fixed wing course first? It is, yeah. We flew the Chipmunk, um, which is a tandem aircraft where you have a canopy and then the um, instructor is in the back and you're sitting on the front. Uh, and I think it's, uh, they, they talk about weight and balance and all this kind of stuff, but I think it was just so that the instructor could keep hitting me on the helmet when I was doing things wrong. <laughs> so that was the Chipmunk. It was a fully aerobatic aircraft. And we flew, I think, somewhere in the region of 47 hours. That included the 13 hours that we did previously on grading, um, which is equivalent to about a private pilot's license mm -hmm. on fixed wing. Um, once finished on that, and if successful, uh, the Army Air Corps can decide on whether they want to spend more money on helicopters and, and putting the, the time and effort into to the pilots to fly helicopters. Um, the Gazelle would be the next helicopter at that time. That's recently changed to, uh, in the UK, they call it the Squirrel. In, in Canada, we call it the A-Star. Um, the Gazelle was the, the next aircraft I flew and the only aircraft I flew for many years um, after passing the course. Uh, at that time, the uh, Army Air Corps also flew fixed wing aircraft, didn't they? Beaver and... <clears throat> they, they did only in the historical flight. Mm -hmm. um, the Beaver and the Oster were aircraft that had no longer any use. Mm -hmm. And so they had them and uh, they had pilots for them, but in the historical flight only. So with the Gazelle helicopter, um, can you describe what the function of the Gazelle and what uses it had within the Air Corps? I can. There were five aims of the Army Air Corps, the five roles, I'm sorry, that the Army Air Corps had. And the Gazelle helicopter fit two of those roles. One of them was observation and reconnaissance. And the, the second one was direction of fire. So the observation and reconnaissance would be useful for any battle situation where you had to have a nimble platform to get very quickly to and from certain locations to bring an idea of that battle picture to the commander as quickly as possible through either radio communications or, or drawn maps. Um, direction of fire was the other role that we had um, in the Gazelle helicopter, and that would be to ensure that the artillery firing would be firing in the correct location and also to adjust the what they call a mean point of impact, the MPI of the rounds that are falling to ensure that that mean point of impact was over the correct location uh, when firing on a potential enemy. You had an observer in the helicopter too, didn't you? Or was there two pilots? The, the observers at that point were for the most part ruled out. Um, they were used very extensively, um, maybe five, ten years previous. Mm -hmm. And when I went through my course, there were very few observers or gunners um, as a co-pilot, for want of a better word, for, for, for the layman. Um, and, and a lot of the aircraft were using two pilots as opposed to um, a, a gunner or an observer. Mm -hmm. uh, one person being the commander of the aircraft, which would be more experienced, and then the other person being classed as the pilot, who, for the most part, had their hands and feet on the controls for the majority of the time. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about the Gazelle helicopter? What difficulties did you have, or is it a fun helicopter to fly? Well, Ron, it's very funny that you mentioned difficulties. Um, I was horrible to start with. Mm -hmm. uh, it was. Uh, it was something that I thought that I would find very easy to do just because I had so much passion about, mm -hmm. about wanting to fly. Um, and I think that because I'm very much somebody who wants to get involved and, and, and figure it out for myself, being trained on this machine, I, I found very difficult um, at the very start. And so much so that when I was on a navigation trip and, and turning through 180 degrees, talking to one person on a radio, remembering the frequency and the uh, squawk code mm -hmm. and looking for the next uh, 
um, location, I, I would be losing a thousand feet, which is unacceptable. Yeah. So I was actually placed on uh, a review for three hours, which I did manage to, to fix. Mm -hmm. um, I went on to um, do fairly well on the instrument flying phase, which is essentially flying in cloud mm -hmm. and uh, finishing up as a, um, as a potential commander on a battle group or battle situation looking after one to two aircraft and, and being in command of a, an aviation reconnaissance patrol and becoming the best or the most improved person on that course, P potentially because I was so bad to start with. <laughs> so, um, because there's lay people or so I say non-military that are gonna be viewing this, can you describe ex uh, what the actual helicopter is each aircraft has different roles, as we talked about, observation, reconnaissance, and direction of fire. Um, the, the Gazelle helicopter, we'll talk about grassroots. Of course, it's, it's very similar to an airplane that, uh, that takes off and, and lands at airfields. The helicopter has something a, a little bit more um, benefit because it doesn't need a runway, and you could land um, in, in a wood if you wanted to, or, or some area that doesn't require such a long, long runway to get off and on. The, the engine or engines, depending on the, the aircraft you fly, the Gazelle helicopter only had one engine. It was the Astazu engine, and it's about that big. It's a jet engine which provides way more power than a propeller engine does, and so it can lift more, um, depending on the design of the aircraft. The, the rotors are there to give you the lift, to, to allow you to go up and down. And uh, for the layperson, they, they've probably seen the little uh, rotor at the back, we'll call it the tail rotor, and that, that allows the aircraft to pivot um, backwards and forwards. The aircraft was um, able to be used for a Kazivac, or in, in Canada they, they use the, the word medevac role um, for taking injured casualties to and from um, the battlefield. Uh, when I was stationed in um, Kenya, um, we, our, our, mind, our main priority was to act as a, a medevac helicopter in case we did have some, some people who, who needed to get flown from an area where maybe a fixed wing couldn't land and then take them to hospital. Okay. Now, uh, you served in quite a few places as a gazelle helicopter pilot. You mentioned Kenya. Uh, what other places did you go to? Well, I flew over all of Europe. Um, I say all of Europe, all of Western Europe. Mm -hmm. um, the idea was to, to get as much exposure to different countries as possible mm -hmm. in different airspace. One of the most notable areas that I did fly was, um, was in Cyprus which is this beautiful Mediterranean island um, in, the, in the middle of, um, well, in the middle of the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. um, we, as the UK, had a listening post there. And it was because it was strategically placed um, in that uh, at eastern Mediterranean location, um, which hit a lot of the, the hot spots that people wanna, wanna know about what, what's going on in those locations. So that's why the British forces was there, and, and so were lots and lots and lots of other uh, forces from other countries. Um, I remember one time when leaving the, 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 the Eastern Sovereign Base Area where we were, we were stationed, and we had an area of two miles that we had to, to, to remain within as a corridor so that we wouldn't encroach on other people's airspace. Because I said that there was lots of other military from other countries that were in this area. And uh, you, you were able to branch off on different areas and use these corridors to fly in at a certain height. And I remember flying past one, one location where I distinctly see, remember seeing a, a, an anti-aircraft missile track me through the sky. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it was quite interesting to see it. And uh, just, I just wanted to make sure that the person on the other end wasn't, you know, <laughs> yeah. with, his, with his thumb on the trigger. But that was, that was kind of interesting to see. Now, that was your first introduction to Canada, too, uh, flying Gazelle. Yes, when I first came to Canada, it was flying the Gazelle helicopter as a pilot, and I liked it so much, I decided that uh, it would soon become my home. 
and you did four tours uh, of battle groups. Or four summers, or yeah, they were they were four summers. Um, three of which were at the uh, Suffield, so the British Army mm -hmm. Training Unit Suffield, so Battis, and one was done in uh, Wainwright. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, at that stage of your career, how you'd been in? How long? I'd been in fourteen years, not counting the service with, with, the, with the junior service. And you were about a sergeant at that point? I was a sergeant, yeah. I was, I was a sergeant recommended for staff sergeant before I left. And then, was that reckoning time as to where you're gonna go with your life, uh, that 14 yeah. year? It, it really was. Um, at the time, the Apache helicopter had been with the British forces for around a year. And all the instructors who were going to then instruct on the, the, the aircraft were, were already flying on that machine. The Army Air Corps had to make a decision on who they were gonna send through for the, the progression of the Apache being introduced into the Army Air Corps. And we were one of the first, in fact, we were the first squadron to be chosen. And not everyone was chosen because there are certain limitations with height and weight and even your, your knee to, to the back of your, your butt is a measurement that they had to, to check to make sure that it, was, um, uh, that it would fit uh, the, the aircraft. So, so 30 of us were chosen, of which I was one of those 30. And I remember thinking that I joined the Army because I wanted to fly. And I'd done so much since. And I think I'd come to the point where I, I'd done enough. I could have gone on to the Apache and it would have been something that would have been ex extremely enjoyable. But I knew that if I did, then I would have to remain in the Army Air Corps for another five years. And that would have taken me to 19 years. And the general term is around 22. And I didn't want to spend my entire career or my entire um, life up until that point in the Army um, they were also being deployed all the way around the world, especially Afghanistan. And I didn't want to be one of the pioneers to, to do that because, of course, it takes time to train new pilots. Mm -hmm. And if there were only 30 of us, we likely would have spent a lot of time in Afghanistan because other pilots weren't trained at that point. And in fact, the people who I did serve with spent a lot of time in Afghanistan. Um, Canada was, was my was my goal, was my idea. Um, and uh, I ended up getting my um, airport, air, airline transport license um, in, the, um, in the civilian world and um, going on to get my license in Canada to fly here in Canada. So you got your air transport license in the UK, civilian? That's, a, that's, an, interesting, that's an interesting question. So because when you are presented your, your wings, mm -hmm. you, you don't necessarily have a license to fly. Mm -hmm. If the Army Air Corps gave everybody a license to fly, they likely wouldn't hang around too long. Mm -hmm. So they give you wings, which allows you to fly military aircraft mm -hmm. only. So in order for Canada to allow me to fly civilian aircraft, they required me to have a license. They wanted me to, or the, the, the rules required me to have a license in the UK first so that I could transfer that license mm -hmm. to a Canadian license. So I actually hold a, a European license for air transport helicopter mm -hmm. and for fixed wing, which I've never used in Europe at all. Mm -hmm. um, it literally was training in order to get the requirements for Canada to switch one license to another. And that's not cheap taken helicopter. You found out uh, <coughs> that it's not cheap to do that on civilian street? Well, the, the hours that I had was yeah. sufficient. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to do any more flying oh, in order okay. to get that license. For the most part, it was study, ground study. Mm -hmm. And because Europe at that time had changed the rules and regulations for flying and, mm -hmm. and everyone became, rather than being a, a British pilot, you're now a European pilot, mm -hmm. there was a lot more to do. So in the end, I ended up doing um, 15 exams mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. um, where ordinarily I might have only done three or four. And this uh, dates back to uh, the, uh, the European Union, and one of the reasons why uh, Britain's so unhappy because of all these new regulations and requirements imposed from outside the country. Well, I, I certainly wouldn't want to speak for everybody in the UK, but I, I imagine that's some, yeah. some reason for it. It certainly was for me. Okay, uh, so you decided to leave the British forces. You took your civilian uh, British or uh, European uh, air transport license for helicopters and fixed wing. And uh, why did you move to Calgary? Well, Calgary seemed to be the best location Mm -hmm. because when I looked at all of the companies that existed that I could potentially fly for, a lot of their offices were in Calgary. It it wasn't later till I found out that that's literally just your offices. You're not necessarily going to be flying from Calgary. Um, But that was the the place Mm -hmm. that that I wanted to be. And it also was very close to the mountains, uh, which was something that drew me to Canada as well. So... At this point then, um, had you already applied for um, residency to Canada? So that was Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Part of the decision-making process that I had for not going on to the Westland Apache was because I'd already been accepted into Canada as a permanent resident. And that was a year-long process, which was a harrowing experience because I had a dream and I had a goal, but I didn't know whether it would be acceptable to get here. And because I had been accepted and that I would need to arrive in Canada within one year of being accepted. I didn't want to jeopardize not being accepted maybe sometime in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, when you arrived in Calgary, you got out of the British Army and then you uh, moved to uh, Canada. And uh, what's the first employment you found? The first employment I had was with Airborne Energy Solutions. They were a company that flew in the north of Alberta, Mm -hmm. BC, and a little bit of the Northwest Territories. They flew helicopters and airplanes, predominantly for the oil and gas industry, hence the Airborne Energy Solutions. And I flew there uh, for two years, and I flew on the Robinson 44 and the Jet Ranger, which is the Bell 206. Mm -hmm. And the jobs that I would be employed with were taking crews to and from the, uh, well, the oil, the oil, you got it, the drilling sites, the the oil patch. Through the winter, the roads are iced over, so they can get there on quad bikes. Mm -hmm. But through the summer, it all melts and turns into what they call muskeg, Mm -hmm. and it's this sticky, oily uh, dirt, which when you walk, it, it, it attaches itself to your feet mm-hmm. so you become a little taller. And of course you couldn't drive on that. So we would be employed to fly people in to and from these, these locations. And also some of the gas wells or the oil wells mm-hmm. would need to be serviced and of course they need to access those as well. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the other things that, uh, that, that I did was, uh, was with bird counting. We would go in for, for the uh, Ducks Unlimited, we would mm-hmm. go and count birds. And it was uh, kind of an interesting thing for me to see because um, having some background in birds as a kid, when I was with the Air Cadets, um, I'd, I'd say to my, my counter guy in the helicopter with me, just let me know if you, if you want some help. And we'd fly along and he'd say, okay, so there's, there's, there's two shovelers like this and, and three, no, no, four, four, five mallards and uh, three three tufted ducks, okay, that's good, and I would point a few out, there's one over here, and all of a sudden, because of the noise of the helicopter, up would go an amount of birds. <laughs> and he would just say, okay, thousand birds. <laughs> and it was kind of interesting because he was being so meticulous with, with counting one those, with those ones and twos and yeah. then missing one and saying, oh no, not four, five, <laughs> and all of a sudden, uh, a thousand, whatever, a flock of birds, and that was kind of interesting. So at that particular time, uh, you took a look at the air cadets, too, uh, okay. when you were in Calgary. Right. Uh, did somebody talk to you about joining, or had you talked about uh, working with the students? Nobody had approached me. I know that 
because I was an air cadet in the UK, mm -hmm. it, it gave me the belief and the understanding that I needed to put myself forward and, and, and give it a go and give it a try. And if it wasn't for the air cadets, I don't know that I would have flown. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's one of those un unknowns. And I, I knew that if I joined the air cadets with the experience that I had gained through throughout the flying that I'd done throughout the, uh, the world, I knew that I had something to give back. Mm -hmm. And so I approached the Strathmore Air Cadets, which is number 903. And uh, they were mildly interested at the time. Mm -hmm. And they decided they would take me on as a civilian instructor um, for a short period of time. Um, it only lasted a year, though, because I ended up uh, moving to British Columbia uh, because there was a, a flying job out there mm -hmm. that I wanted to, to get involved in. And it was instructing. It was instructing on the, um, the, the Robinson 22, the Robinson 44, and the EC-120. And if, if I'd have stayed in, in Strathmore, in Calgary, I probably would never have done that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, uh, uh, you started off. What sort of things did you instruct in their cadets? For the cadets, the, the instructions that I, I gave them for the start mostly was looking at their classes and giving some, some pointers. Okay. When you first join a squadron, when of course you're an unknown, mm -hmm. getting, okay, here, go and teach this particular subject, the, the officers, they, they don't know what you're capable of. So mm -hmm. it's one of those things where you, you kind of have to step back and, and wait until they think you're ready for, for more mm -hmm. things. So a lot of monitoring classes mm -hmm. to start with. And giving the young kids a little bit of guidance and a little bit of life experience. That's right. Okay, so you had one year there, then you moved to Abbotsford as an instructor for a, heli a private helicopter company? That's correct, yeah. So because I'd spent so much time away in the Army, mm -hmm. and because I'd spent so much time in the oil and gas field with Airborne Energy Solutions for two years, I decided it was time to, to stay at home, just to be home, to have a, a nine to five job where I could still fly. And because I, I have a flair or certainly a passion for instructing, mm -hmm. I thought that, that that would be the best thing to do. And I, and I was taken on with a company called TRK Helicopters out of uh, Langley in British Columbia. And they had a school and I flew with them for uh, six months until they decided that the school wasn't something that they wanted to continue. They, they just started the school a year ago and they weren't seeing as much business as they'd like to see. Mm -hmm. So they decided to close down the school and it gave me an option to either go to another school or try something different. And that's when I looked across into Abbotsford, into uh, a company called Chinook Helicopters who flew the Bell 47. Mm -hmm. The Bell 47, which helicopter is that? The old one? Yeah, the Bell 47 is, is one of those very loud and slow aircraft that you would expect to see on shows like MASH, yeah. where, they, where they do the medivacs in, in Vietnam. So the Bell 47 was also called the Sioux, which the British Army had. Incidentally, was the aircraft that my dad flew in as an observer mm -hmm. when, I was, mm -hmm. when I was in North Yorkshire. Uh, so you uh, again this was instructing beginning helicopter pilots or yeah so the instruction that I gave was for brand new people who wanted to get into the industry whether they wanted a, a private license with 50 hours or whether they wanted a commercial license uh, with over 100 hours and the idea was to go through a, a set syllabus so that they could get their license and do whatever it is they they wanted with it um, during the time with Chinook Helicopters was, a, was a, a very interesting pivotal point which not too many people get the chance to do. Um, my father, who was in the UK at the time, he decided to come and visit. And I was only working with Chinook Helicopters for three months. It was a three-month contract. So a very small window of time, and, and, and my dad decided he wanted to come and visit during that time. And because I knew that he was a, a crewman on the Bell 47 or the Sioux helicopter in the Army Air Corps, I decided to put a little surprise on for him. I ended up getting some, some donuts and some, some lunch and putting it into a bag and telling him that I had to go and do a ground run on, on the aircraft. And, and would he mind helping me push it out and, and then take it back in again? 
So we did that, and the the up the upshot was he jumped into the aircraft while I was doing my ground run, and then he I said, "Did you want to go for a flight?" And he's like, "I." I, I was hoping you might say that. Mm -hmm. So we went as father and son for a flight in an aircraft that he flew as an observer 30 years previous. Mm -hmm. He knew all the numbers. Mm -hmm. He knew all the numbers. He could fly the, the aircraft. The hovering wasn't so great, but uh, we ended up flying into the mountains, into Gold, uh, to Golden Ears National Park. We landed on a sandbar, had our donuts and, and lunch and, and, and bonded. It's one of the, one of the pivotal times that, that, that I, I can certainly remember. Then again, uh, from Chinook helicopters, you went to uh, fly with Helijet International. Yes. What What's involved with that? Helijet International. Across the Strait of Georgia, you have an option to go on a ferry, which lasts two to four hours, depending on where you're going. You have an option to fly fixed wing, or when the weather's bad, you have an option to fly a helicopter. Um, I say when the weather's bad, the, 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 the limitations on weather for a helicopter are a little less than an airplane because they don't require any long place to land. Mm -hmm. In fact, we would take off and land at the harbour. So mm -hmm. this was um, Vancouver Harbour and we would fly all the way to Victoria Harbour. And the passengers would be higher paying passengers because it's a lot more money to, to go on to Helijet. And we would go across the Strait of Georgia probably four to five times a day. And um, uh, that, that, was, that was exciting because of the, the weather that, that we, it, we would see there. We would be flying either in cloud or, or sometimes just low level down the, down the beautiful, through the islands, just fantastic. So you have a good idea of how many ships and oil tankers move down that coast. <laughs> yes, I do, yes. Uh, and in fact, we would see them on the radar um, because of we would approach to that, that harbor. And of course, those, some of those ships are, they're pretty high yeah. and we want to make sure we didn't bump into one of them. And so how long did you do that? I only did that for four months because my ultimate goal after not being able to instruct anymore at TRK helicopters was to join the Calgary Police Service as a pilot with them. I had applications in with the Calgary Police Service many times and the communication that I had when I started with Helijet was that the Calgary Police Service were actually looking. And so I did apply before joining Helijet. And the process of going through training with Helijet and then starting to fly with them as a first officer, at the same time, I was going through interviews and flight tests with the Calgary Police Service and was accepted as one of the four new pilots with the Calgary Police Service at that time. So then you took that job, obviously. I did. And um, what did that entail uh, for you? Well, um, I'm not sure really what I can say. If I'm allowed to say much. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So the, the Calgary Police Service have, at the, at the time, had one helicopter. It was called Hawk One. Uh, Hawk, H-A-W-C. It stands for Helicopter Air Watch for Community Safety which I think is, is kind, of, kind of good that they've come up with that acronym. The helicopter initially was designed for police safety. There was a, a constable, Constable Rick Sonnenberg, who had been killed some years previous on the Deerfoot, which is number two that goes through the center of Calgary. And he was killed by a speeding car, which was stolen. And the mother, and the sister of Rick Sonnenberg decided that there must be something better. There must be something, some tool that can be used that's better than, than running across the, the deer foot trying to put a spike belt out in, in front of some, some vehicles. And the helicopter was the way to go. And, and after some work with the local news station, um, and eventually they, they came up with Hawk 1, um, which originally was a McDonnell Douglas 500, and then went on to become the EC-120. When I joined uh, the Calgary Police Service, they had just purchased through the lotteries mm -hmm. and uh, raising money through different companies, uh, Hawk 2. And they, they flew the, the both, which is one of the reasons why they took on four pilots right away from, from scratch. And 
the idea of the, the two helicopters was that one would be on maintenance and the other one would be operational. Because a lot of maintenance goes into, every hour you fly, you have to have somewhere in the region of an hour to two hours of maintenance. So one aircraft would always be on call, ready to go 24 seven. So we had a day shift and a night shift. And the idea was to ensure officer safety. We would be called to many calls where we would be useful. And because we used a system called FLIR, forward-looking infrared, we could also see during the night through the camera that we had. We also wore night vision goggles so that we could see a little further at night as well without need, the need to look at the camera. Some of the calls that we would be asked to go on would be, for the most part, and, and the most enjoyable would be stolen, stolen vehicles. And a lot of people have, have this idea of the, the aircraft swooping down like they do on TV, and they're swooping down, and they're going through all the buildings with, with sirens blazing and all this kind of stuff, which doesn't actually happen. The safest place and the best use of the aircraft would be quite a lot higher uh, at around 1,000 feet or maybe 1,500 feet, looking at a bird's eye view of what's actually going on. That gave the opportunity for me, the pilot, to maneuver as I'd like, and also the tactical flight officer, who is the police officer assigned to me, to call that stolen vehicle and to ensure that the, 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 the police force on the ground were as safe as possible. One of the most memorable calls that I ever went on was Alberta's very first Amber Alert. There was a child who was sadly abducted from uh, Drumheller. And we had got this call. Uh, actually, my, my tactical flight officer had left already for the night. It was, uh, I think, 3, 3.30 in the, in the morning. And he was, uh, he was due to be clearing at 3 o'clock. Um, but anyway, I did call him and I said, we've got this Amber Alert. They think they have the vehicle on uh, a, some sort of tracking system. I forget what that's called mm -hmm. uh, with GM. OnStar. 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 Yeah, that's right. So they, they, they believe they had the car on OnStar, which gave us a, a really good idea of where to look. So we decided to get the aircraft ready and we, we flew out, um, heading for the Drumheller area. And we were given some ideas from either sightings and, and little blips of OnStar that had service in that area at the time on um, where this car likely was. And we, we went out without night vision goggles because we didn't have them at the time and no real mapping software. So we had to kind of use our idea of where we were in the middle of this, this black abyss with a few lights from some of the, the neighboring cities around. We did get some idea of where the car would be and we searched in that area. OnStar did something which was fairly interesting and they put the four-way flashers on the car, which alerted our attention straight away because these four-way flashers coming out of the, the, the black abyss and we did locate it. We climbed up to a height that we wouldn't be able to be heard and we coordinated the RCMP to come in to all sides of where this car would be without the, the driver knowing and of course OnStar has the ability to slow the car down when they get to a certain speed. So for instance, when he turned a corner at 30 kilometers an hour, 30 would be the maximum speed. And he may think that maybe something's wrong with the vehicle rather than just stopping it right away. They, they managed to get it to a complete stop and have the four-way flashes on. So after the coordination of all of the RCMPs, one of the vehicles which was driving so hard for so long actually caught fire. Uh, it was uh, something that they were extremely passionate about finding this this young lad, and we coordinated coordinated the um, the I guess effort to hopefully get this this child back to back to his parents. Um, the whole operation lasted around two hours, and once we had all of the cars ready to go, we coordinated the effort from each of the vehicles. Um, under the, the camera, the infrared camera, to see where they were, because we couldn't see the car outside, we just see the flashing, it, it was too, too dark. And at the time where the commander of the operation shouts, go, 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 all the police come in with their, with their weapons ready to go, 
Um, we came all the way down to around 500 feet. And, and as you bank the aircraft, it, it gives this, this crazy slapping noise with the rotors and it, and it puts the, it, 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 really, it really scares people. So, so we were there and the spotlight was obviously on them at the same time. And, the, and this, the person who abducted this child must have wondered what the heck was going on with somewhere in the region of 20 RCMP, the light from above, mm -hmm. this noise. And um, it ended successfully with the child being unharmed and, and sent back to his uh, parents that, that day. That's interesting. Um, I'm curious, that type of helicopter, um, how many hours of fuel do you have available to you? That's a really interesting question. And another interesting answer would be it, it all depends on the temperature of the day. As the temperature of the day gets warmer, the blades of the helicopter can't bite into the molecules of the air as good, which means it can't lift as much. And of course, weight, the fuel is, is weight, it's heavy. So in plus 30 degree temperatures, we can probably take two people and maybe an hour and a half. At minus 30, we can fly for four hours with full fuel and, and two people on board. You returned to the 903. I did. Uh, and which provided an interesting background. Uh, you became a civilian instructor and you were a civilian instructor for three years, just helping them out, getting to do more and more as they become more familiar with you. And uh, then you decided to uh, go become an officer in the CIC world. I did. It was something that one of the previous COs, um, Major Lammers, had asked. He had said, why aren't you in blue yet, it was, was his comment. And at that time, I didn't really consider it too deeply because I was already making a difference, I felt, in civilian clothing. And I didn't know why I should really get in, back into uniform after spending... Um, 15 years in uniform with the British forces. Mm -hmm. And then when I started to realize there were certain courses that I could take to aid the cadets more. For instance, I, I was not able to do the range safety officers course mm -hmm. because as a civilian instructor, mm -hmm. it, wasn't, it wasn't open to me. And there was a lot of other things that the cadets were missing out on because I wasn't in uniform. And because we were very short on staff at the time, it was an easy decision to make, to, to get into uniform, to get qualified with other courses, and also to take on some of the roles and responsibilities within the squadron that I was not able to do as a civilian instructor. One of them being supervision. Mm -hmm. We require a, a, a paid person to look after the cadets. Mm -hmm. Overnight activities when you're away from the local headquarters, and I wasn't able to do that at the time, and if, it, it, it was a means to an end for sure. Yeah. And it also had another benefit down the road that you uh, probably didn't realize at the time. You met your wife. That's correct. <laughs> I did. I was wondering where you were going there. Yeah. Um, lots of benefits, but that would definitely be number one benefit for me. Mm -hmm. On my first course, um, I attended the lieutenant qualification course. Uh, there are actually uh, two other courses that I could have attended beforehand, but because of my previous experience, I, I wasn't required to attend those courses. So the lieutenant qualification course was my first course that I went, and Adrian, um, who's now my wife, she was on that course, and that's where we first met. Um, we actually stayed friends for four years over the phone, um, calling each other every couple of months, once a mm -hmm. year, and then it wasn't until she decided to come to Calgary for a CO's conference and I asked her if she wanted to stay over and we could maybe, uh, maybe get to know each other a little bit more mm -hmm. that, uh, that our, our friendship got a little bit more serious. So at this time, were you still flying for Calgary Police? I was. Yeah, I was still flying for about three more years uh, before deciding that the, there, there was another avenue for me to go because essentially I fulfilled everything at that time that I wanted to fulfill. And uh, after spending six years with the Calgary Police Service and, and doing day shift and night shift, it, it became a lot, especially with the cadets and, and also some other, some other ideas that I had, uh, I had going on at the time. Okay, so then back into civilian life, so to speak, and into the blue uniform. Uh, so stepping from one blue uniform to another blue uniform and um, 
Where did you go with your, with your employment process then? Well, I knew that I wanted something more. I wanted something for myself. I wanted something that, that I could run. For, for my whole career, I, I'd put in a lot of time and a lot of effort, a lot of work from, from a very passionate person into somebody else, into somebody else's ideas, to somebody else's employment, somebody else's work. So I decided that I would try doing this for myself. And I ended up buying a, an event company, and it was called Gold Standard Events. And I ran that company for around four years. And during that time, I felt as though it might be good to get into real estate. And so I did. I took my real estate license. I got licensed in real estate. And I, I figured that there was a different way that I could sell real estate. I could, that there was, there was other options that people could have. And I thought that maybe I was the, um, the catalyst to, to bring, bring in those options to those people. So that's when you started. Did you get rid of the other business or you're doing both? I, I was actually flying with the Calgary Police Service, <laughs> running gold standard events, doing real estate and cadets as a commanding officer of that squadron at that time. So I was doing a lot at that time. I decided that one of them had to go and that's where the Calgary Police Service and, and, and myself ended. And I, it took me about two more years to realize that I needed to focus on one thing specifically. And because the real estate was doing quite well in Strathmore, I decided that Gold Standard Events, which was doing okay, but had lots of inventory, and I wasn't really employing too many people because I was just making, just making it. I felt as though I was doing a lot of work for, for next to nothing, for, for, the, for the sake of owning a business. So I decided to sell that business and predominantly look at real estate only at that time. And of course, Air Cadets, which, which hasn't stopped to, to this date. One of the other reasons I decided to focus on one thing was because people know you for who they know you for, for what they know you for. So for instance, I'm trying to sell real estate and they say, are you that police pilot guy? And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm the real estate guy. Oh, are you the caterer? I didn't cater at all. And yet I had an events company. And so I wanted people to understand that, that this was my focus. Mm -hmm. And that was the reason for moving into real estate 100%. Um, I spent uh, two years as a realtor before I was able to be licensed as a broker. And only as a broker could I have my own business and run my own business the way I wanted and bring those options that I talked about. Okay, and meanwhile, you're developing your real estate business and uh, you became heavily involved with the cadets running various courses. I did, yes. The regional cadet support unit, which was out of Winnipeg, mm -hmm. uh, they had asked me on my second course if I wouldn't mind consider instructing for the school, which at the time was called the Regional Cadet Instructor mm -hmm. School. The school taught officers like myself who were coming through the program, the basics of being an officer, uh, occupational courses, environmental courses mm -hmm. for, for air, learn about mm -hmm. air subjects like survival and, and flying, mm -hmm. and on to intermediate courses and then commanding officer courses. So. I was asked to, to teach these courses, and I have been doing that uh, to date for the last five years. And you're still teaching them once or twice a year? Yeah, this year I only, um, I've only taken one, um, and that's the air course, which is coming on later on in mm -hmm. the summer. And last year I think there were two, and the year before seven, I think, something like that. Okay, so you do get away and uh, do a few things. Uh, now. Your involvement with the, uh, you moved down, decided to move down to Medicine Hat and open up a, a branch company of your... Uh, yeah, so I started the, the company Orange Jigsaw Real Estate in Strathmore. Mm -hmm. And because of the idea that I had to bring options to people, mm -hmm. that I wanted to bring people options for sale rather than a one price fits all, I wanted to give some people options and I didn't know whether it was going to work. Mm -hmm. And it started working quite well in Strathmore. And I, and I figured, I wonder if I could do this again. I wonder if I could do this in another, in another city. 
And initially I was thinking of the crow's nest pass because of the mountains I'd come to Canada because of that reason. And that was one of the, one of the options to, to go there. But I felt as though the economy wasn't there in the crow's nest pass. So because of the friendship that I had started to become with, with Adrian, and because she was a commanding officer of the squadron in Medicine Hat, and because we felt that there was some, some relationship that you know, could become a, a lot more, we decided that we would give it a go in Medicine Hat and, and bring the same brand and the same options to Medicine Hat as we had in Strathmore and to, and to, and to grow that company as well. And to, to ask my business par partner, uh, partner, Jonathan Peters, who is also a CIC officer, to look after the office in Strathmore and I could mentor from it from a distance. Mm -hmm. So that left me now with, with two offices of Orange Jigsaw Real Estate, looking after both of them and, and having one person essentially manage that one office. And you also decided to get married in that time. Yes, I did. Right? Yes, I did. And then you had another development that comes after that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So Adrian yeah. and I decided to marry and we were blessed with um, my first son and her first son as well, um, mm -hmm. Quinn. Um, it's, it was something that we had planned for about a year and after being uh, 42 years old, I didn't know whether it, it could happen and um, within, within that year it, it did and, and we, we were blessed with Quinn some nine months later. And uh, moving down here, you decided to become involved with the uh, number 15 uh, cadet, Air Cadet Squadron. That's correct. In Medicine Hat as deputy commanding officer. And then when Adrian was pregnant, she was a commanding officer. You took over. I, I knew that I'd made a difference in, in Strathmore. Mm -hmm. That was evident from the success that I'd had with the cadets, with a growing squadron. And also I taught the cadets who wished to get their lighting license or power license. I, I taught them separately mm -hmm. from cadets still a cadet activity, but it was something that I volunteered for, and I did that for eight years. And it turned out um, two pilots a, a year, whether they went glider or power, every single year. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want that to end. So when I come to Medicine Hat, I knew that I would have to continue that process. Mm -hmm. So uh, in one year, I was traveling to Strathmore and being in Medicine Hat, and we ended up having two cadets in Strathmore again, and then two cadets in Medicine Hat. So four of that year for, for the pilots and the glider scholarships, um, where some squadrons may not, may not get any um, because they may be missing that, uh, that person to mentor them through the, the, the exams and, and, and the training. And I've continued to do that ever since. Um, are you still like actually running a ground school for any cadets that are interested in pursuing the aviation beyond the curriculum yes as such i do i i run the ground school every wednesday from september and through to december the air cadet exams are usually taken in the start of january so my aim is to sit them four mock exams before they finish in december and they have the holiday break to study and then to hopefully pass that exam yeah. We, we, we then go into what we call board training, which is essentially interview training, because after that exam, and if they're successful, they will then go on to an interview, a board of three people mm -hmm. to decide on whether they're, they think they're suitable for the mm -hmm. courses. And of course, a lot of these cadets haven't sat an interview at all, yeah. ever. So we go through five to six weeks worth of training on Wednesdays as well to bring them up to speed on the interview processes mm -hmm. and just to get them comfortable with with sitting an interview and understanding what's good to say and what's not good to say and, and priming them best we can and typically how many cadets would you have in your squadron that would be taking that course at any one time with you the most i've had on that course was 13. That's usually you find uh, around 13 or 14 to start with at the start of the the year in september and in december you may end up with around seven to to eight, maybe nine cadets. Because of course they realize it's a lot of work and, and some of those who think that it's, it's gonna be simple, it, they, they realize it's not, mm -hmm. and it's, it's not for them. Good, thank you. 
Mary, thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for a century of service.